So, where is he? And why is he taking so long to help me? For when you need help, you need help. Where is he? And why is he so taking so long to help me? Our Old Testament reading today talks about God being in the fire at night and in the cloud during the day, revealing himself by audible voice, instructing his people, his presence among his people. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day? I would love that, wouldn't you? Just to realize God's presence and leading. Our art today from the Old Testament to John chapter 11 and then to Revelation is the arc of where is he and why is it taking him so long to help me? I'm a very patient person all the time in my life, as long as I get what I want when I want it. Can you relate to that? It seems that somehow our expectations, our, our patience quotient has moved down and down and down from days to hours to minutes to microseconds. If there's anything I need, I can have it on my doorstep in 24 hours by Amazon what? Prime. You know what I'm talking about. So how is it I should have to wait for anything? If you, if you are driving, I don't mind if you're behind me. But please don't be in front of me at a traffic light and be fiddling with your radio. Because about two seconds later, my impatience starts to take over. Does that bleed over into our spiritual walk? Where is he and why is he taking so long to help me? I'd invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 11 today. John chapter 11. We've been studying the book of John, and we find there a series of signs that Jesus, uh, miracles that Jesus performed, that was proclaiming that he indeed is the Son of God. He is indeed worthy of our worship. And you'll remember that he has just healed the blind man. Out of total darkness, his eyes are open. And he sees Jesus, and word goes out, this is Jesus who has healed me. Now that's a great story, but there's a natural progression in here as Jesus is slowly proclaiming by his signs, his words, and his deeds that he is worthy of all of his disciples' glory and all of the worship that might be given to him. Do you believe that, friends? The arc, of, uh, the arc of John chapter 11 is a call to worship Christ in all of his glory. But the story isn't all that glorious. For you see, the story is rather mundane. And the story is rather painful, depending upon who you are in this story. So we're going to just kind of go through the story of John chapter 11 today. And we're going to find six or seven lessons there today. So I'd invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 11. And we'll start at, um, let's start at verse 4. The, uh, let's start at verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her 
Hare, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death. This sickness is not unto death, but the Bible says, But for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, Naz uh, and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. So where is he? Where is Jesus when he's needed? Well, they sent word to him, Jesus, come quickly. Someone you love, someone who, whose house you abode. You don't have a house. You spent many meals at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. You abode in his presence. And now we need you. Where is he? He's two days journey away. That's where he is. And he doesn't seem to be in much of a hurry to get there. I don't like that. I don't like it when I want something. Particularly when I'm asking of the Lord. Lord, please, please hurry up. Give me patience and I want it now. God's timing, verse 6 teaches us that God's timing is perfect. Verse 6, when he, heard, when he had heard thereof that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. His disciples said unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and you want to go there again? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walks in the day, he stumbles not, because he sees the light of this world. And Jesus is telling his disciples, the second thing, walk in the light while the light is with you. He who walks in the light doesn't stumble like he who walks in darkness. Nobody would seek to go on a journey in total darkness, would you? Without light. There's an interesting, the scripture has an interesting way. If you look at the stories as they line up, Jesus has just healed the man with blindness. And he goes from total darkness into light. An amazing thing, isn't it? But now you have another story where this is starting out. And Jesus is saying, wait a minute. Those who are walking in darkness don't have light. Why would you want to walk in darkness anyway? When you have the light of my life among you. It's incredibly fascinating to me how sometimes people think that they can study darkness long enough, they'll get to light. It's just incredible. But it happens all the time. As if you were to, if you were to go out at night, there, there, is, a certain, uh, there is a certain amount of, of poetry here. If you go out at night in total darkness, you can see the beauty of the stars in the universe, can't you? Even in total darkness, there's some of the light and handiwork of God that will draw you to Him. But that being said, Jesus is saying, don't go into darkness to find light. Come to me. I am the source of light and walk with me while I am with you. This story teaches that we should walk in the light as we have a light with us. In, in John chapter 11, verse 22 to 24, we're going to, uh, we're going to move rapidly through this passage. Well, let's, uh, let's go to verse 10 first. But if a man walk in night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. These things he said in verse 11, 
And after he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may waken him out of sleep. And the disciples said, If he sleeps, he does well. How be it Jesus spoke of his death, that they thought he had spoken of taking a rest. Then said Jesus plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you might believe. Nevertheless, let's go on to him. So we find a statement of Christ saying very clearly here, Lazarus is sleeping. He's equating death with the sleep. But he's making it very plain that he's deceased. Verse 15, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that the intent you might believe. Nevertheless, let's go on to him. And he said unto Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let's go, that we may die with him. And then when Jesus came, he found that he had laid in the, four day, in the grave for four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning his brother. And when Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, Martha being rather impetuous, went out to meet Jesus. Mary, on the other hand, stayed in the house and waited for him. Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it unto thee. Where have you been, Jesus? It would have been much better had you gotten here earlier. Have you ever felt that way? Has God ever left you hanging and waiting and wondering and asking and pleading? Two days, four days, He's in the tomb. Where are you, Jesus, when I need you? It's a question that comes streaming down through the centuries of time, right into our time, into our lives, into our hearts at times, because we know He's with us. We've seen in the Old Testament he was a pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. We see in the New Testament he walked with his disciples. We know in the future we will see him face to face. But where is he now? And where is he when we need him? The lesson is from John chapter 11 that Jesus waited. He waited. Verse 22 through 24. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou ask of God, God will give it to thee. And Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha responded, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection in the last day. I got it, Jesus. He'll rise again, but I want to see him. If you had been here just a few days ago, I wouldn't have to wait for that day future. Verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, what does the Bible say? Though we were dead, Yet shall he live. And Martha didn't get it. She's thinking that the resurrection will be a resurrection off in the future, at some point in time. But Jesus was proclaiming his divinity. Jesus was proclaiming that he, was a, he is the Son of God, and He has power to give life. He has power to give life to those who have gone to sleep in rest in death and call them forth. So let's go forward, verse, uh, verse 33. Let's go to verse 33. When Jesus 
uh, verse 32, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And in verse 33, is a piece of Jesus' humanity connecting with ours. The scripture simply says, Jesus wept. Because one of his children was laid to rest. Heaven cries every time someone breathes their last. Because God wants to be with us. He longs that we would be in his presence. Jesus wept. Why couldn't have he have been there four days before? Where was he? He was there. Now he's here. And he's understanding the pain, the human pain that Mary and Martha are going through in his presence. He brings compassion. And in his presence, he brings life. Let's follow along in the story. He wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Even the Jews said this. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, came to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone laid on it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Take away the stone. So they went next to that cave and two, two men rolled that stone away and the smell of four days old came forth from that tomb. And there was nothing but darkness in that tomb. There was no hope. There was no life. Only quietness and emptiness. But he rolled away the stone. It couldn't have happened unless the stone had been rolled away. How is it in your life? Do you have some caves and tombs that are sealed up? And Jesus needs to roll away that stone. That his spirit, his words, his life might enter into the dark places of your life and bring forth life. How is it, friends? I love those words. Roll away that stone that I might enter into, that I might take that darkness, that I might walk and send light where there is hopelessness and bring hope to the hopeless. I love this story. It starts out so painful, and it ends so miraculously. Take away the stone, verse 39. Jesus said, He will do that. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he's been in there four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou should see what? If you believe, you will see what? Oh, you got to stay with me, friends. You're going to miss the whole message today. If you would believe, you would see what? The glory of God. John chapter 11, verse 4, being repeated again in this verse. Roll away the stone, let Jesus in, and you will see the glory of God. They took the stone away from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said to his Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hast heard me always, but because of this people which stand by, I said it, that they might believe that thou hast sent me. And then, and then, the sixth lesson is, 
And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And quietly, out of the darkness, they heard something moving, still wrapped in grave clothes. They could see just enough light into the all of that darkness. The words of Jesus penetrated that lifeless form. And just as creation, just at creation, the Spirit of God breathed in to the breath, uh, the breath of life into that lifeless form, Jesus' words penetrated that lifeless body. And life sprang forth. And Lazarus came forth. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there, friends? Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? Wouldn't you have liked, where is he? I don't care if he waits 12 days. I don't care if he waits two months. I just want him to show up. How about you, friends? How about you? You see, it's not about our timing. It's not about our desire. It's about Jesus' desire to show you how He works in such a way that you will bring honor and glory to Him. He could have come sooner, and maybe they would never have gotten that message. He could have delayed His coming longer, but He came right on time. How is it in your life? Are there some dark places that you want Jesus to take hold of? Are there some areas in your heart, in life, where you need to say, Lord, there are bits and pieces of my life that need to be changed, and I need you to come into that empty place and fill it with your presence. Desire of Ages says that uh, in the chapter on Lazarus, says that divinity at that moment flashed through humanity. Did you catch that? Divinity flashed through humanity. Everybody that was there realized that that was a divine moment. And I've often pondered that because it's used very little infrequently in the writings of Ellen White. Divinity flashed through humanity. Many of you have smartphones. You know when you do a screen capture, you hit the power button, you hit the home button, and it flashes? It was that fast. It didn't take a long time for Lazarus to come forth. But everybody got it when God was at work. And that's the way He wants to work today. Where is He? He's right where He needs to be on His throne of grace. How accessible is He to you? He's just an opening of the heart. Your opening of the heart to Him. And He will come and abide with you. So we find the pillar of fire, the cloud by day, Lazarus coming forth. Let's go ever so quickly to Revelation chapter 21. We find there the story of glory in the Old Testament... John chapter 11, we find there the story of glory. One more spot of glory in Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 through 27. Where is he? He will be coming again. And I saw, um, Revelation 21, verse 22, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need for sun, neither of moon, to shine in it. Verse 23, for the glory, interesting for the usage, for the glory of the Lord did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. No darkness, only light. Do you see the linkage? John 11, not walking in darkness, walking in light, glorifying the Father. And the nations, or people of them, which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor unto it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day or night, for there shall be no night there. 
and they shall bring their glory and honor to the nations or people into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh an abomination or maketh a lie. But they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. God wants to work in and through us that our lives might be lives filled with light. That the areas of our lives that we have trouble surrendering, we might do so that our lives might glorify Him. John chapter 11 is a story from hopelessness to hope, from darkness to light, from Jesus being way out there to way in here. I don't know how it is in your life, friends. I don't know the quiet spots in your life or the areas that are hidden from view. But what I do know is He is the one that can give us light and life today that we might glorify Him. Let us pray together. Father, we thank You for the gift that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, at times we wander through life. We feel close to You. At times, Father, it feels like we can almost audibly hear Your voice. And then there are other times, Lord, when you seem so distant and far off. But in your timing, Father, and in your way, and according to your purpose, you are indeed with us. You come to us. You breathe into our lives by your Spirit, hope. You renew us. You shed light into the darkness, dark spots of our life. You take areas of our life where we are spiritually dead and bring newness a spiritual life. And Lord, we long, we long, Father, that today, today, Father, you would bless us that we will live to glorify you. That as we go forth from this place, we will, be share, we will be able to share with others the way that we have been blessed, that they too might share in the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask in his precious name, amen.